Hi there, Lee Farnell here, and this is Leading Your Best Life. Today, I want to talk about leadership, culture, high performance, whether it be leadership, culture, and high performance in sport, or leadership, culture, high performance in business, or even leadership, culture, high performance in your family. But it's all about leadership and culture. Stay tuned. Here we go. Well, thanks for listening, because when we're talking about leading your best life, there's a there's a saying, a proverb that's on my PDC Growth Sporting Services website, the forest shapes the tree. It's a French proverb. Think about it. The forest shapes the tree. The ecosystem we live in, grow up in, shapes our performance, the standards, what we expect from each other, and what, what, what weeds we walk by versus what weeds we take out, we hold unacceptable. The forest shapes the tree. And I'm holding a book by David Parkin and Paul Burke. It's a fantastic book. It's called Captain Coach Leadership. It's a book I got many years ago. I can't remember where I got it from. Um, But it talks about, and this is a subtitle, Performance Strategies from Professional Sport. Performance Strategies from Professional Sport. It's probably gone out of print now. I know it's hard to get hold of. Copyright 2009, reprinted 2011, printed... uh, Anyway, check it out on the internet, published by Integro Systems. Um, Just a fantastic book. It talks about transforming teams, particularly Australian uh, football teams. Uh, It talks about the Sydney Swans, talks about Geelong. I think it's pre, it would have been pre-Richmond, but Richmond, of course, um, in fact, I think he does talk about Richmond in here, where Richmond modelled Geelong, uh, which again, we talk about, and again, what we do with clubs is we say, the quickest way to improve performance is to model excellence. We use NLP strategies and tools to do that. But um, there's so many great chapters in this book um, putting the cultural settings in place and the, asking three fundamental questions posed by Dave and Wendy uh, Ulrich who are we who are we what do we do how do we behave who are we what do we do and how do we behave and he talks about Sydney Swans um, here it is most players coming into the AFL this is from uh, Leo Barry, former Swans co-captain. Most players coming into the AFL are very talented, but to be able to step up to that level takes a lot of self-confidence. And Paul Ruse really helped me gain confidence because he was constantly reinforcing the message to play your natural game and back yourself. Um, given that mistakes at the AFL level at the time were normally met with the message of abuse from the coach, it must have been very reassuring to be playing alongside an all-Australian centre-half back who constantly instilled confidence in you. Not surprisingly, the fortunes of the team turned around fairly quickly and Ruse was appointed the senior coach. In the off-season, Paul Ruse brought in Ray McLean from leading teams to work with the group on establishing their trademark behaviours, team rules and to elect a leadership group. For Leo Barry and the Swans, it was quite a challenging process, agreeing on how they wanted to be perceived internally and by the football community, which was not so difficult, but being assessed by your peers on how you actually rated against those trademark behaviours was completely new territory for the playing group. When you have to tell other senior players that they are not portraying the behaviours that we all agreed to be measured on can be quite confronting. In fact, is quite confronting. For most of my football life, I was used to just following the coach's instructions. Now we were being asked to not only establish a set of standards, but to also tell our peers whether or not they measured up. This was a whole new way of approaching things and not only challenged the playing group, but questioned everything we thought we stood for and redefined the culture of the club. And it goes on and on about how Sydney Swans um, transformed their culture. And here, when it came to electing their leaders, the players were asked to nominate five players they wanted to be in the leadership group. Surprisingly, Barry Hall, Adam Goods and Michael O'Loughlin, who were all all All-Australian players, were overlooked which was quite a surprise to the football media who were used to the best players being traditionally being selected as as leaders. 
It was particularly disappointing from out, for Adam Goods, but it really defined for him and other players who missed out what was expected of the club's leaders. Towards the end of his first season as coach, Paul Roos decided to have another vote on the club's leaders and one of the members was replaced. In his mind, it reaffirmed to the players the direction the club was going and announced to everyone that the leadership group was not a boys' club and that you had to demonstrate the trademark behaviours on and off the field. Um, whether it's Brett Kirk, Craig Bolton or myself, if you do something outside the team's rules, it will be addressed and the appropriate penalties will be applied and believe me, being sanctioned by your peers is a very powerful warning mechanism. It is much more powerful than being pulled up by a member of the coaching staff and that is one of the reasons our culture has become so ingrained in the psyche of the playing group. We have been empowered to effectively run the team in the best interest of the players and the football club. It is definitely not just tokenism. Paul Ruse, Ruse, is absolutely committed to the process of empowerment and has given over the reins to us and other members of the coaching staff. I believe it suits his leadership style because most coaches are not able to let go of decision-making processes. It has become a powerful form of competitive advantage. Another point here. The culture of the Swans has significantly impacted the club's recruitment philosophies. You cannot have a big ego and survive at this football club. We seek out people who have their heads screwed on and who have a work ethic that will ensure over a five or six year period that they will develop into AFL footballers. Brett Kirk was twice rejected by the Swans, yet through hard work and rigid application of our trademark behaviours, he has become an invaluable member and a co-captain of our team. It's amazing how much your own self-belief and buying into our system will improve you as a player, let alone the impact it has on you as a person. And of course, Brett Kirk then went on to uh, be an assistant coach at the Fremantle Dockers and brought a lot of positive influence to that group. Now, let me just read the creed, the creed of the Bloods. They worked this, they worked on this as a group, and not only do they, well, not only do they commit to these, this Bloods code, they call it, but at the end of each game, they rate themselves and they get a rating out of 10 as to how they performed against this code. Let's, let's look at it. Since the Bloods code was compiled from various sources, is as follows. One, hardness, discipline, relentlessness. Two, there is no acceptable defeat. Three, each defeat is treated as a learning opportunity. Four, no lead is insurmountable. Five, courage in the face of adversity. Six, everyone takes responsibility. Don't wait for others to act. Seven, weight of numbers wins matches. If most play players win their positions, the game will be won. Eight, accountability for winning your position. Nine, not all players are equal. Players must earn respect before they can be part of the Bloods. You've got to earn your place. And as I said, after each game, the Swans players are asked to rate their performance against the Bloods' behaviours, and these are reviewed by the coaches and the leadership group. From time to time, the leadership group singles out one or two players for peer assessment based on what they thought of their own game. After the Swans' narrow loss to St Kilda in round one of 2008, Paul Bevan was asked to step inside the circle for some feedback. Bevan, who was 23 years of age at the time, had played 71 games, including the 2005 Premiership, but his leaders sensed his lack of self-belief evident in his self-assessment and wanted to put on record their quite different views. He was told by his teammates how much they liked his work ethic and his professionalism. They encouraged him to back himself and not worry about making mistakes, but they asked him to be more vocal on the ground. Not an easy thing for the bashful Bevan who struggles to believe that he belongs at the AFL level. Subsequently, he worked within the club's he worked with the club psychologist on techniques to develop his self-esteem. Uh, it goes on. This book is just so good. I like this. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle to get feedback. The book goes on, talking about the stirring of the tigers, how Brendan Gale literally wanted to model the 
Geelong, and literally he said in 2009, and a friend of mine was actually here in the gym at that speech, um, he set some targets to be reached by 2014. He said, we're going to, one, play in three final series, two, eliminate the club's debt, and three, enlist 75,000 members. In addition... The plan outlined the club's vision for 2020 that's defined as the power and the glory. By 2020, this is it, the Tigers will have won their 13th premiership, currently at 10. In other words, they're going to win three premierships over the next few number of years. Consistently provide the most powerful and exciting match day experience in the competition. Three, once again, have the most powerful supporter base in the country. And four, enjoy the AFL's strongest and most powerful connection with its members and fans. Also, part of the winning together plan are the Tigers' values. If this goes on, where they talk about being relentless and united as a club while showing leadership and pride. Now, they built on that. They did. They built on what happened at Geelong. They built on what happened at Sydney Swans. And they did win their three premierships. They did get that number of fans. Um, and they were certainly, as they said, the most exciting. And they certainly had the strongest and most powerful connection with their fans. In other words, they lived it out. So what's the lesson in there for you? What's the lesson in there for you personally in terms of setting goals, setting vision? What's the lesson in there in terms of you, whether it be a sporting team or a business team, in terms of what are your trademark behaviours? How do you hold each other accountable? How do you have a leadership group, not just a management group, but the leadership group, so that people step inside the circle? Are they willing to do that? I commend this book, Captain Coach Leadership um, by David Parkin and Paul Burke to you. If you're serious about human potential in sport or business, get hold of it. Um, I've done a whole range of interviews with my good mate Brian Cook, um, capturing what he has done, taking many of these principles, both at Geelong and Carlton and even West Coast Eagles, uh, how there is a science to high performance. And when you apply the science, when you work the system, when you engage the people, when you have them not playing or working out of fear, but playing or working out of pride and code. We call it the fruit bowl, the context. Who are we? What's acceptable? What's unacceptable? What are our goals? And how are we going to talk to and give feedback to people who are outside the code? And how are we going to build self-belief in people? It's a science. We take pride in ourselves helping both sales teams, businesses, sporting teams, human beings realize their full potential you want to find out more about how we do it, um, get one of our free tools. We've got an audit, particularly a sales audit, but even a culture audit. And um, we can help you if you want to be helped, if you want to take things to the next level. Continuous, never-ending improvement. Thanks for listening. I'm Lee Farnell. I'll see you next time. <laughs>